Hey there, I'm Melissa McCain. I'm a developer advocate with JFrog, and I am here with... Um, hi, everyone. I'm Damian Curry. I'm the technical director for Community Alliances with Nginx. This is our second episode. Uh, we're yes. excited to do this. This is the one where we actually set up. So in our previous episode, we just talked about some tools. We might continue that conversation a little bit more today. Um, we talked about planning. Um, and there were a few things that have happened since the last time we met up, Damien. Um, mm -hmm. I know uh, last time we did start out the conversation with planning in general. And I, what I mean by that is like the actual tool that you use to plan your tasks and your iterations yeah. and things like that. And since that's all heavy on my heart, I decided to take that one on and go off and try a few things. And we named several. And um, we also had like a list of must haves that we wanted. I think one of yours was like something like uh, maybe a tool that every, well, not a tool that everyone loves, but maybe something that not everyone hates. Yeah. I think that's always, especially with these sort of tools, it, it doesn't matter which one you pick, somebody you're working with is going to hate that one. So it's, you know, yeah. you just find the one that, that is simple enough for what you need to do and doesn't make you jump through a bunch of extra hoops, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So some of the other things was uh, easy task entry and status reporting, um, shareable with all of us, um, easily maintained. So we talked yes. about a SaaS version rather than something we have to set up and manage ourselves. Um, easy access, of course. Um, I wanted simple, that was my primary thing. Simple, yeah. simple. It, uh, it seems like some activity. Yeah. It seems like a lot of those tools, it, it takes you a week to figure out how to use the tool before you can even start working on your project. And it's just like, no, we want to, we want to build the thing we're trying to build, not become an expert at this planning tool that, you know, you're only using because you really need something. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then another thing I wanted was just something that was easy to add information to, or like external documentation or yeah. links, you know, we need the conversation with the task so that it's not a mystery when we go back and look at it, uh, what happened and what decisions were made. Yeah. And especially being able to, you know, associate with multiple things, right? So it's not just putting in links, but it's like, okay, maybe we can go, oh, hey, we're talking about something that needs to be done. And and here's like a link to the pull request or, you know, just being able to make it easy so you don't go, okay, that thing's done. Now we need to go find the thing in the repo and find that thing and then go through it all. And it's just like, oh no, it's here. Click, click. And we're done. Exactly. And then, you know, just to be able to plan iterations and things like that, get um, some scheduling involved in there. Yeah. So I went out looking and I did try a few, I'm not going to name a bunch of names just because I, I tried them. I signed up for accounts. I fiddled around a little bit. And then it occurred to me that, you know, what would be really cool <laughs> is to just keep it as close to our repositories as possible. And yes. last time we did decide to stick with GitHub, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you went ahead and created a uh, organization for yes. the Nginx and Mara project. We did because, you know, we, and I think this is something that we got to, we'll get into later, but, you know, we run across that thing where you start out and you're just like, oh, I've got this little project. It just needs a repo. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I kind of need another repo, but I don't want to clutter it up. So I'll just make my repo kind of bigger and then you get this sprawl and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know, this would all make much more sense as an organization. Right. Right. Yeah. Totally makes sense. And also kind of a, a third party place to put it so we can get other folks involved and uh, get some attention on it. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest thing with all of these projects is we want to do this in the open, right? Like it's, it's who cares if we're sitting here talking about it, if nobody else can actually see what we're doing and we want, we want this all to be tools that other people can grab and you know, learn something from. Yeah, exactly. That totally makes sense. So I was poking around in there in the new organization that you made, and I um, realized there's projects in there that we can yes. use and which, it's free. And which I actually had not come across yet because, yeah. you know, it's it's so funny. I, I feel like, I mean, I've, I've done the same thing with Nginx plenty of times and I, I work here, but it's like you use <laughs> GitHub so much, but you have your workflow. And exactly. you're like, okay, no, this is where I push code. This is where I open issues. And then all of a sudden you look, you're like, wait, what does that tab do? Yeah, exactly. Something I've never even looked at before. I, oh. I was exposed to it um, at the CD Foundation, actually. Um, oh, great. On the uh, Technical Oversight Committee currently. And uh, we use it to, um, you know, show like a roadmap 
of things that we want to accomplish. And that was the first time that I had really uh, seen it in use. Um, so yeah, once I uh, reminded myself that it existed, I went ahead and uh, created a new project. And I want to show you what it looks like. Yeah, that's great. OK, so um, this is our little organization. Oh, just started, so yeah, yeah. something it's, brand new and fresh. Yes, yes. It looks like everybody's does when it starts. Kind of <laughs> right. bleak and uh, not not very fancy, but we'll get there. Yeah, lots of echoing in the hallways yes. <laughs> right now. All right, projects. So I created a new project. Um, it's called Nginx JFrog Mara Demo. And uh, the very first view is the board view. This is my favorite because this is where I get to drag and drop things and um, have all kinds of fun. Now, yeah, these are just this is the where you're going to spend most of your time too, yeah. right? And that's the nice thing about the simple tools is you can quickly, there's just a little plus sign just to add a new item. You're not having to learn a bunch of different things. It's, I mean, I've had a little bit of time to poke around on it. It's pretty straightforward, which I always yeah. like. And you have the ability to create new views. So if you don't like the board view, you can certainly look at a list view. Um, but I'm going to look at our board view at the moment. You can hide um, columns if you don't want to look at them. I feel like these two might be a little bit redundant for us. We might consider getting rid of them. We'll see how they work. Yeah. Um, I created a couple new items. Now, something that's interesting here is uh, each one of these, you have an option to convert it to an issue. But an issue is actually tied to a repository, not the project. Yeah. That was a little bit confusing for me. So that's why these are sitting here as draft, because they don't really, gotcha. at least for now, apply directly to a repository, especially this one that says create the repository to begin with. <laughs> so um, well, it's nice to be able to have that, like, again, like we were saying, directly tied to the stuff that you need to work on. Right. Exactly. So this one, I'm excited. Uh, let's take a look at it. Let's drill down in here. Really easy. I can really easily add more information if I want to um, update anything. I can assign people. I'll assign myself to this one. Um, uh, give things a different priorities. I like the little pictures here. Yeah. Look at the volcano for urgent. That's awesome. Uh, size. This one's very tiny. Uh, again, you've got other options here. Um, and then for this one, I'm just really, really excited that I can just drag it over to done because I did go. go ahead and do this one already. Now, there was one other thing that I wanted. Uh, I think we solved a lot of our requirements here. But one other thing that I wanted to do was add iterations because I want to, yes. you know, this list is going to grow, right? And I only have two yeah. in here right now, but uh, we're going to add more to this. And we kind of need to block our time and prioritize these. So I figured out um, just from the documentation, you need to go into the settings. And in the settings, this is where all, you can add and delete custom fields. And these are the default ones that we started with, status, priority, and size, which we already looked at. We can actually add a new one. Um, I can name it iteration. And it can be type iteration. I can set when it starts. I can set the duration of the iteration and uh, save that field. Now I have the option to go back into one of these tasks and I can assign it an iteration. Oh, very nice. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's always good to have that, even if it's not like a hard end date, but just to know like right. I need to get to a stopping point because... I know we all do it where it's just like, oh, but I could just tweak this little part or I could tweak that part. And if nobody tells you to stop, all of a sudden you've been working on the same one thing for a month and you're like, wait, I didn't need to do all of that. I just needed to move on. Yeah, exactly. Now that's one thing I didn't play with is if you can adjust the length of the time for each iteration or if they're all like hard coded, they have to yeah. be the same. I don't know. That's something we can toy with. Yeah, we'll, we'll play with it as we, as we start figuring out what we actually need. Because that's the other thing here with a lot of this stuff is it's it starts out and you don't really know what you may need at the end of the day you, right. you know we've got a decent starting point and we try to future proof ourselves as much as we can but you know it's always just being open to adjusting how we do things as you move along right exactly so first thing that i did that first task that is now done is i went ahead and forked the project that we're going to be starting with this is the spring pet clinic cloud project 
Um, it actually was inspired by a microservices version of uh, Spring Boot, um, uh, another pet clinic version. So a couple things that happened when I forked this. Apparently last year you can now uh, fork a repository, but only copy the default branch. And um, that just means, you know, some projects have multiple, multiple branches. They could be anything. They could be bug branches. They could be feature branches. They could be previous versions. Um, it just depends on how the project is set up. Uh, we can argue all day about how it should be done, <laughs> but um, the end result is, is when you have a bunch of branches like that, it can be a pain to clone that over and over again. Think about every time you build, for example, in a build server, you clone the repository potentially, and um, that can take a lot of time if there's a ton of branches. So um, that was an interesting uh, thing. I did go ahead and just copy the main default branch. Yeah, especially with those older projects that have been around for a while, you know, it's it's always good hygiene. Like if you don't need if you don't need it and you're going to be heavily modifying it, like why why drag it around with you, you know? Right, exactly. Now, there are a few things that I was reminded to in doing this. Um, you have the option to fork, which means that gives you the option to go ahead and contribute back to the original project, right? You mm -hmm. also get all of the history and everything with that. Yeah. Um I don't know if we are going to contribute to this project or not. That's still something on the back burner. Um, one thing I did notice is that there's, you know, this particular project is still using master branch instead of main. That seems to be, you know, that's yeah, going to be what everyone's we, moving to. We definitely want to change that in ours as well. Yeah, that might be something we can contribute then there you to go, yeah. spring project. Um, but the other option instead of forking is to copy the project, you know. Um, you have, if you have no intention of contributing back or you, you just need a copy that is left alone, um, mm -hmm. you can copy and you can also do that with the history as well. You can, you know, yeah. get all the, I find that helpful, especially if you're modifying an existing project, right? Because you don't want to just repeat the same mistakes. Um, and a lot of times commit messages will tell you exactly why things were done. At least that's how it's supposed to be. So hopefully. <laughs> I know I'm guilty of making not very useful commit messages, but you know, <laughs> hopefully most of those projects are dead now. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, all of that was interesting, helpful things to consider. I have been on a project in the past where there was a copy done and no history was mm -hmm. saved. That was pretty difficult um, to navigate. I mean, you know, we all have to learn how to read code, but it sure would have been nice to understand why some of that code was written the way it was. Yeah. So yeah, cool stuff. So what do you think? You like this? Uh... I, I, I think it's a great solution, right? It's, you know, something that it's a tool that people are used to, even if they don't know it's there yet. It's obviously easy to onboard users. Everybody's already got a GitHub account, right? It's not, it's not something that's going to scare people. And, you know, one of the biggest things, especially if we're, you're trying to do something kind of more out in the open and wanting people to contribute, mm -hmm. even if you don't, necessarily like it. I'm not saying I don't like GitHub, but you know, it's one of those things where if you want people to contribute, you got to come where they are. You can't expect people to come and, you know, use your weird bespoke something or another elsewhere. It's good to just say, like, hey, make it easy for people because the easier it is, the more likely they are to actually, you know, push out a bug fix or, you know, give you feedback and open issues. But if they are using a tool they don't know, they're just going to go, whatever, I'll, somebody else will report it, right? Right, exactly. Exactly. Well, the, so the next step in the process was, um, you know, I'm just wanting to do the simplest thing that works right now, yeah. download this code, um, get it set up on my local machine. Um, one thing that I noticed, and I just want to point it out, is there's an editor config. Oh, yeah. File. Um, this is a project that uh, I, I, I just used by default, um, didn't really pay much attention to it other than just appreciate that it was there. So here's more information about editor config here. Um, there's a lot of IDEs that support this and it is just not worth the time 
arguing with your team about how things should be uh, when you're, you know, arranging your code or writing new code, uh, modifying existing code. Uh, this is something that should be set up initially. And if it's not, the team needs to pause and get it set up and commit all of the changes necessary to make all of the formatting and everything consistent across the board, because yes. it is absolutely infuriating when you try to compare changes and it's all just a bunch of white space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's always the worst. And you know, it's, and it's also one of those things, like you said, if you don't have it in the beginning, it's so much harder to go back and try to implement it later than right. to get it rolled out in the beginning. Cause then it just, you know, nobody thinks about it. Right. Um, yeah, it'll save a lot of arguments too. Yeah. It's important. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just kind of read through it. It very, very simple. This editor config file is pretty simple in here, pretty straightforward. Um, but all of these IDEs support it. I'm using IntelliJ, so I didn't even have to use, you know, download a plugin or anything, but there are plugins available for others. So yeah, nice. uh, worth checking out if you don't have that already. Um, one other thing that I noticed in this project was that. It's all in one repo. Now, yes. this is a microservices project, so I was confused at first. Yeah, and it's you know it's a it's a not uncommon thing, and I I kind of mentioned it before, but you know when you have these you know demo sort of applications, they people end up making concessions, right? They're like, well, this isn't really how you would do this, but it's a pain to clone a bunch of repos and do this is for just a demo. But in, in my opinion, I think that's why so many demos are aren't all that helpful because right. they're not showing you the real world. And that's the whole thing we're trying to do here is, you know, let's be open about what it, the ugliness that it actually is involved with, you know, building stuff like this. There is, there yeah. is complications and there is a bunch of reasons why you need to think about how you're organizing your repositories. And it's the exact same thing we kind of did to ourselves with the Mara project, which is why you'll, if you notice when you went back to the organization, there's only the one repo in there. And that's because I need to move our project because it was created as a single repo and we hit the same thing. We're going, man, we can just keep creating subdirectories and just break it up that way. But then we're eventually going to end up with this huge unwieldy thing that you can't tell what you're doing. And so, yeah, it was, this was just kind of the perfect time. It was like, well, we need an organization for this project. We've been talking about moving our other project into its own organization. So Hey, this is a great, a great reason to do it. And, you know, a lot of that, why these sort of conversations are so important before you start. So you yeah. can kind of come to these decisions rather than having however many people you have working on a project, making their own assumptions and making their decisions. And then all of a sudden realizing that, wait, we've been doing things in a different manner and we're using different, you know, we're using different editor configs, right? And it seems like a small deal until you go and try to push everything into production and it gets real complicated. Right. So my hope in looking through this one is that there aren't a lot of like interdependencies between these, each, each one of these directories here mm -hmm. um, is basically it's, a, you know, its own image, its own service. So this is going to be fun figuring that out. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I would like to do with this project is, um, possibly pull one of those out into its own repo. Let's start with the way it is for now. Get it up and running. Yeah. Make sure everything's working as expected. And then I want to pull one of those out. Because what I would see like in a microservices project like this, you could potentially have separate teams even mm -hmm. working on each of these services and they might not even be the same language. So yeah. they could they might even have completely different CI activity going mm -hmm. on um, and different release cycles. That's another problem that I see with this type of um, organization, you know, having everything in one repo, it, it might little, be a little bit tougher to figure out what version is this service and what version is that service. Yeah. Um, well, especially because so many things and, you know, when you're dealing with the CIs, they rely on those, those commit tags. Right. To know what to deploy. Right. That's like how it's usually a lot of times gated for production is, you know, OK, well, you, I'm going to call out the specific tag and then it's like, OK, wait, but I'm calling different tags for different services that are in the same repo. And it, yeah, it just makes makes trying to figure out what's actually running such a headache. Right. 
Now I have heard arguments for having the same repo. Um, if there are any interdependencies or any shared libraries or anything or any shared calls or whatever, it certainly is easier to, if you have to make an edit in one place, you can edit everywhere else too. Yeah. Um, but not sure that that's a good enough trade-off. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, there's other solutions like with, uh, Oh, what do they call them? Is it uh, sub repos? You can basically like include other repos, which again has its own problems, but it, that's even easier in some ways because then you're keeping them separate and able to share that code still. So mm -hmm. it's you know a lot of those things of you know it's just it's just the little things that don't seem like a big deal at the time, but then when it does become a deal of problem, it becomes a really big problem. Right. right well. So all this talk of the code. Yes. Um, now, what do now, we do with that code? <laughs> yeah. So building it, um, it seems fairly simple with this particular project. Um, I mean, I have a Java Maven background, so it's easy for me to get things up and building. Mm -hmm. But I also know what's going on in the background is I am repeatedly going out and um, requesting artifacts from Maven Central. Um, Obviously, once I pull them in, they're cached on my machine. It's a whole nother, whole nother thing to know <laughs> is going on and pay attention to. Yes. Uh, but same thing with Docker Hub. So um, there's some images that are available publicly out on Docker Hub with this project. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm bringing those in as well to yeah. my local environment. And it's, and it's all, all works great, but it's great for your local environment. But now it's, you know, if we get more than one, more people working on it now it's okay well where do we put all of this so that everybody can you know kind of access the same images and and make sure there is that consistency between the builds right so now we're to the crux of the issue we need storage for our artifacts we need to manage yes. it obviously yeah. i work for jfrog so i know a lot about artifactory but let's let's have a discussion about like what a team actually goes through deciding what to use and how do they make that first step into choosing yeah. a solution? Yeah. And I think it, it starts the exact same way. It's, oh, I'm doing it locally. And then it's, okay, well, let me see that. Let me, give me that image. And you're like, oh, wait, how do I do that? So most people are just going to go, okay, let's just, I mean, Docker Hub, right? That's that's the original container repository. And, you know, it it's kind of like GitHub. Lots of people have accounts there. It's where people are going to be pulling images from. Um, but again, it's, you know, there's, there's downsides to that. Like, I know one of the things that's come up a few times in the recent, not too recent past is the, uh, rate limiting they kind of put in on some of the images. So if you're going and pulling the same image over and over and over again, you, you might run into a time where somebody can't pull it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And this would happen all the time with build servers, right? Because often mm -hmm. You will even, you know, remove cache and stuff in order to have a fresh build, especially if you're yep. getting ready to release. Um, yeah. Yeah. So how annoying that is to have your build fail for that yeah. reason alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's because then you're going, oh man, the build failed. And you're like, oh no, it didn't really fail. I was just getting throttled by Docker Hub. And, you know, and nothing against them. I totally get why they were doing it. Like, it's one of those things where everybody loves it. It's a free service. It's like, yeah, but somebody's paying for that bandwidth and that storage. And that gets, like, everybody forgets how, it's easy to forget how expensive those data transfers are. Like, right. you know, it, your AWS bill gets real expensive, especially when it comes to just the in-out traffic. It it's it adds up real quick. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Um. So... Artifactory has a like a partnership with Docker such that if you were to use a commercial product like that, um, you have options that will allow you to bypass that throttling. Um, pretty cool to be able yeah. to do. And I, I think the idea behind this is just that if you're going to be using a commercial product like that, you're going to be more responsible about how you use it. Yeah. So um, I would hope that that isn't a bad deal for Docker. <laughs> no, that should be pretty Our good, but throttling all artifactory users <laughs> yeah but, well and then um, you come into the whole thing too of like you know there's there's definitely that that immediate place i go to is well i can build one right i'll, right. I'll install all, all artifactory or i can install you know, and of course i blank on all the other ones but you know you can you can install one of those things locally but then it's okay where am i going to run it yeah right? how yes because i'm exactly. not going to run it on my laptop if we want other people to access it i mean yeah. 
I, I think we were talking last time we're looking at we're probably looking at like starting all this up in digital ocean. Um, yeah. I, I don't think they have like a container registry as a service yet. And then also there, I mean, it's, it's all going to cost money. So it's one of those interesting things where there's so many times where I have that gut reaction of like, Oh no, I'll just install it and build it myself. And then yeah. because like, I'm not going to pay for it, but then it's like, Oh wait, I am paying for it. And right. a lot of the time that sticker shock of the like, oh man, they want how much a month for whatever service. And then you go back and look at your cloud bill and you're like, oh yeah, probably would have been cheaper if I would have just paid for that service rather than running it myself. Yes. I like that you brought that up because as a developer, that was always my default mentality is yeah. you know, what can I get for free? Because I'm not the one holding the company credit card, right? Like, exactly. And, and it wasn't really... The first thing on my list was not wanting to go in and argue for something without being able to try it, use it, see how it goes, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Especially you when you just fall, have to go. You just have to get it going too. Right. You also fall into that trap of you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I have definitely been there. I did that. I did that exactly. I uh, did not think we needed a management system. I just created our own Maven repo, uh, created our own Docker registry, actually. Mm -hmm. What a pain when I realized, oh, all these things need to be hosted somewhere. Oh, well, they need to be backed up somewhere. <laughs> Someone need to be, needs to manage this. Yeah, they need to be updated. <laughs> they need to be, you know, you need to have- Cleaned I out. Mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got to clean up after it. You got to make sure you have a, a DR plan. Like you got to have those backups again, going somewhere else. Exactly. And, you know, and, and, that's, and that's the worst part because those are the jobs- that always get forgotten because everybody's too busy doing the other things. And then all of a sudden your instance crashes and your data store gets corrupted. And you're like, well, I hope we have all that work somewhere else that we can uh, pull together again. Cause yeah, it's, it, it, it never happens at a good time. Right. Right. <laughs> this is true. Luckily I didn't have that happen to me, but uh, quickly did realize, Hmm, I really would like to spend more time actually developing than maintaining all these systems. Right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the whole reason why there's so many SaaS offerings out there. It's, you know, and then also, um, especially as you get into it too, and you end up with these, you know, kind of the SaaS offerings where there, maybe there's more than just one thing, right? We could just install Artifactory locally, but right. then we wouldn't have access to like, you know, the, the x-ray, the security scanning tools and like some of this other tooling that, you know, maybe you don't need it when you first start out. So maybe you do run a local artifactory, but then you get a little bit more and you're like, oh, okay, now we're going to have to really start worrying about security. We're going to have to do these scans. We're going to have to actually make sure we're, we're doing this safely. And, yeah. and, you know, you all of a sudden start seeing the kind of tool sprawl too of, okay, well, I need this tool to talk to that tool to talk to this tool. And then it's, you know, where, where are you hosting all of those? And it, it, it starts getting complicated, right? Yep. Yep. There's only so much you can future proof, but there is some that you need to have common sense about. Yeah. Um, I know like there are some community uh, versions of Artifactory mm -hmm. that might only support Java or only support containers and Helm. Um, if that's realistic for your project, that's great. But again, you know, transferring all that into, you know, the commercial offering might be a little more difficult than you expect. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, all of these things need to be considered. And yeah. when you go and look at commercial products out there, there's other things to consider too. Like, uh, do you, uh, pay per use? Do you pay per seat? Yeah. Um, yeah. All of those things. A lot of different interesting billing methods. Right. And it, you know, I know I've definitely had the thing where it's like, okay, well, this one's per user. So everybody's sharing this one user account, right? And it's, it's not the right thing to do, but it's what you're going to do when you're trying to save, save money. But then you run into issues of, wait, who made this commit? Who did that? Like who? And then it's all of a sudden, nobody wants to own up to it. And, you know, there, there's, there's a reason why you want everybody to have their own account and a little bit of accountability for everything. Right. Well, we need to start with something. And I, do not want to maintain it ourselves. I don't think that's a good choice <laughs> for this project right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, and, and the cloud you know, providers do all have their own container registries. That they do. is an option. Yeah. But especially again, they, they get expensive fast. True. And it's, it's the balance. And they're also, I mean, nothing against them. They're just a container registry, right? 
right. it's it's much more geared towards like here's a local copy of your images for deploying in that cluster or in that region or something like that rather right. than a more central build process it's more like you would push it in my mind you kind of like push it there when it's ready to be deployed into production yeah that makes sense it's like a like an edge node for like a yeah product, the product that's in the right region near so it doesn't take as long yeah, yeah that makes sense and i mean we do have to always keep in mind who we actually work for and hey we might be able to get some get some more free licenses or get some more extended uh usage and you know take that's advantage true. of those things you got um, some companies will offer like open source solutions um, for reduced costs or no cost. Um, that often that just involves, you know, writing up a proposal, that kind of thing. Um, it might have to do with how popular your project is too. You might run into that. Mm -hmm. um, also the foundations as well, if you yeah. are. Those are those are always good. I know the CD Foundation um, you know, tries to meet the needs of its projects that are part of the foundation. If there's um, infrastructure costs, uh, things like that, uh, they will they will try to help with that. Yeah, and it's always important to you know take advantage of what you got too. Like that's uh, especially on early stages on projects. You know, you're gonna beg, borrow, and steal, right? Like you're just you right. just want to try to get things going. And I think the biggest thing, like you said, you can't we can't future proof everything. And right. I think one of the big things in my mind is just that like. While you know that you can't do that, it's also just good to remember and tell yourself like, hey, this might be the decision we make today. Might mm -hmm. not make sense in three months, in six months, yeah. right? And if if you just kind of keep that in the back of your mind and just, you know, try to avoid that, you know, even vendor lock-in, right? Like it, the same thing happens with the cloud providers. You go, okay, I'm using AWS. And then all of a sudden, everything is built around, you know, their tooling, their tool for this, their tool for that. And maybe now you've got to go move to a different cloud. And now you're like, oh, okay, well, now my infrastructure doesn't exist because I was relying on this and that and this, and then you're starting from scratch. So it's it's one of the biggest things in my mind is just not not trying to get the perfect answer, but just trying to make sure you're focusing on like, you know, protocols, not products, right? Looking yes. at concepts and and trying to make sure that if you do have to make a change, it's not going to be the end of the world. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. um, at some point we do have to actually implement what I look forward to on this project is I want multiple implementations because yes. there's always going to be teams with different requirements, different, um, different ways of doing things, uh, different skill sets, you know, maybe they're very familiar with mm -hmm. one product or over another. So I'd love to see examples of all of those permutations, right? Yeah. Um, for us, since we have an in with JFrog at the moment, <laughs> Um, I'd love to just start with their uh, SaaS trial offering and see how far we can get with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to show you was just how to how the repos can potentially be set up. And oh, I yeah. think, yeah. So like this concept of um, local repos, remote repos, and virtual repos. And I think these concepts will translate pretty well into other solutions too, so that uh, it will help people, um, you know, make some decisions when they're going with other solutions. Um, if some of these capabilities aren't there or they don't need them, um, they can make sure that these other solutions will meet their needs. Yeah. And it's good to just know that there's just different options too, right? It's not just your images go here, right? There's, there's different variables and things that you may or may not need. Right. Exactly. Okay, so um, I want to show you just how I initially set up some Docker repositories. And this is actually a trial version that I've used in a workshop, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Um, and I like to share it just because, um, just to go over that concept. So uh, in the menu on the left here, we have repositories here, um, local, remote, and virtual. These are like the primary types of repositories and again, this concept will translate to other solutions as well. So when I think of a local repository, I think of not local machine, not like local to your machine, but um, local to your pro project or organization. Um, oh, gotcha. This is the, yeah, this would be the place where you would put something, you know, like um, private, I, I guess another word would be a private repo. Um, stuff that you're building yourself internally. Yeah. 
and or needing to share with other teams internally too. Yeah, but not, maybe you don't want necessarily just anybody being able to grab it. Exactly, exactly. Proprietary. Yeah. Um, so the next one is remote. This is the one that's interesting. Uh, this is the one that involves caching. So a few reasons why you might want something like this. One is uh, if you're in an organization or in a team that's behind a firewall and you don't have access or direct access to the internet, to Maven Central, to NPM, to Docker Hub even, uh, there may be some restrictions there. And one way to route all of those requests is through a central location like Artifactory um, to have that place where you can request those items. They can be cached and managed at that level. Yeah, which is... So especially important now, especially like NPM. I mean, we've all heard the the nightmare stories of, oh, wait, that package you rely on is gone. Or, you. you know, like, you know, there's there's lots of stuff there and just also all the vulnerabilities that are possible and just being able to go like, yeah, just pull the version from here. It's been vetted. We know it's locked to this version. You, you, you know what all your stuff is running. Yep, exactly. And, um, I feel like anything that your project requires, you need to bring in house in some way, shape, or form, either a copy of it, a cached um, version of it, something. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is going to help you keep your builds actually running. <laughs> Especially walk to a specific version. So if yes. there is a change, you know, that doesn't doesn't catch you off guard, right? It's it's easy, it's really easy to just go, oh, I'm just gonna grab the latest. I want the most up-to-date one. But right. you know, all it takes is one build to fail when you realize that's not always the best plan. Right. Um, one other thing I want to say like about remote repositories, we all use them. I, maybe if you're a super secret government agency or something and you write everything on your own, <laughs> uh, maybe you don't need to access remote repositories. But most of us are not in that position. Uh, we are always, you know, reusing libraries, obviously taking care with licensing, that kind of thing. Of but uh, we use publicly available stuff so that we aren't continuously reinventing the wheel. All right, uh, the last one I wanted to talk about is virtual repositories. And this one is interesting because a virtual repository, at least in this context, is not a physical location. It is a, um, a grouping of repositories. So if you have a project and you need to access both remote and a local repository or even multiple remote and local repositories, it would be nice to have just one URL to reference all of them. And that's what this virtual repository does. So if I drill down in here, um, it gives uh, the items included, which is the, you know, one local, one remote. That's just the default of how this one was built. Um, but you can add additional ones and you can prioritize as well. And perhaps if you're in a situation where a repository is defunct or needs to be removed, or um, you want to um, eliminate a bunch of packages from a particular mm -hmm. repository and replace it with another one for your developers, you can do all that under the covers without disrupting their flow because they aren't ever going to have to change the uh, reference to the remote repository or the virtual repository. Yeah. I mean, I think that right there just saves so much time of not having to go, oh, wait, which repo am I pulling from? You're saying, yep. no, you grab stuff from here. We'll make stuff available that you need. Yep. Yep. Pretty cool. Um, I just wanted to show that one, one reason to pay attention to repositories. Uh, one other thing I guess I want to say about repositories is I often see cases where teams will create one repo and put everything in it. We already discussed why this is an issue with code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's also an issue with artifacts and your build artifacts, yeah. Um, because it's just a it's a pain to clean up. It's uh, difficult to figure out which projects are using which artifacts. Um, backing that up can be an issue. Uh, moving that huge repository around if you need to can be a huge issue. Uh, so, I like to see. Uh, repositories like this and registries, Docker registries as well, that you have one per project. And not only that, you have one per environment. Mm -hmm. So a single project might have a development repo and a test repo 
and a staging repo and a production repo. And as artifacts are cleared for a particular stage in the development lifecycle, they are moved or copied into the next level of repo. Yeah, having that gating and separa separation so that you know, oh, I'm pulling from the production repo. I'm going to get the production ready stuff. And again, when you're having that automation in the build so that hopefully you don't have to go around and go, hey, what, what version should I be using, right? Or is latest fine? Or should I be using this other one? It's, you know, having that clarity around what should be, should people be deploying, right? Yeah. It sets up some guardrails too. Um, yeah. There's been a few times in, in my past where we've had instances where someone accidentally ran tests against the production database <laughs> or uh, that's pretty bad. Yeah, it's I definitely crazy. crashed a few production databases <laughs> by, you're like, what is this query going to do? Oh, wait, that was prod. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, or deploying the wrong thing, deploying something that was actually not ready for production. Well, yeah. if you're always deploying from a production repo, you shouldn't ever have anything in the production repo that you can't deploy. So exactly, um, this helps you, you know, protect yourself a little bit. Well, um, we did, I guess that brings us to version control, right? We're going to start yeah. with this project and we're going to need to consider versioning and start, you know, managing that carefully and making sure everyone's on the same page there. Yeah. And it's definitely one of those topics that everybody has an opinion on and they're just isn't a right answer except for use it, right? Like right. you you can make up your own rules on what's a minor release, a major release, a dot, like, you know, whatever you want to do is is fine. You find the system that works for your team, just have a system. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I had a really interesting conversation with someone recently about uh, Sember. Hmm. And I mean, that's just, that whole idea where, you know, you've got your, your major version, your minor version, your patch or, you know, yep. version, that kind of thing. And I guess the biggest complaint, which I never thought of it this way, was just that that's so, it's, it's a good idea. I mean, ideally that works. Mm -hmm. but how many times have you upgraded and it wasn't compatible when it should have been? So the idea is a yeah. uh, a different minor version, but the same major should be compatible, yeah. right? And it's something, it's a decision that's left up to humans too much and we make mistakes and sometimes it's just not the ideal situation. Um, so wouldn't it be cool if we had like a way to predetermine the next version? Like if you wrote all your code and you, you know, submit it and create the new build and then something on the back end decides for you what that version is, determines yeah. whether if it's compatible or not. And if it isn't, it automatically bumps the version number. I don't know if something like that already exists, but I think that would be pretty cool. I mean, that's what you're, that's what you're looking for, right? Because again, it's who, who decides if it's major or minor, right? Or, you know, right. it, it, are there even guardrails around that? I mean, I've done it where people are just bumping up versions as they do builds just kind of ad hoc like oh i need a new one so i'm just going to up the version because that will kick off the build server it's like well no you could have manually kicked it off because now we've got extra versions that are never going to get past the lowest level of product of development and right. then you've got more of those images and more of those and now you get numbers and it's yeah it's like so much else it's there's no right way you just you just got to do something right uh the other Issue two is just understanding when a version is um, immutable. Yeah. Um, some are not immutable. Uh, we expect that. Mm -hmm. We expect, you know, our releases, our artifacts to be immutable, unchangeable. That is the version. Any Anything different is a different version, right? Yeah. Sometimes though, and I know early in my career, I've been guilty of overriding a version because I just didn't like it. <laughs> You know, create a new version that is that is labeled the same. Yeah. Um, that's a bad deal when you have a bunch of other devs that have already cached that version, the mm -hmm. the old version, right? So um, there are problems there. That's an obvious one, but maybe less obvious is how images work, how um, container images work. Yeah. Um, 
those tags are absolutely mutable. <laughs> yeah. They can be overridden at any time. And I've seen it build systems where each stage an image is rebuilt and supplied with the same version. Um, huge problem um, that can, you know, propagate a bunch, a number of different servers, a number of different machines, and you can have cached uh, versions that are labeled the same, but they're actually different. Yeah. And then you somehow, one of them makes it into production and all of a sudden everything, nothing works anymore. And everybody's scratching their head going, wait, that's the right version, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure why I, I feel like in the past, there was some reason that we, we got really attached to a particular version number and just wanted it to be that version number. That's just silly. That's just going to cause me more problems than well, it, it. You know what it always, that usually tends to be is somebody somewhere hard coded that version number and nobody can find it. And so they're going, <laughs> well, I know if we just keep pushing the same version number, it'll keep working. So right. <laughs> I know I've, I'm guilty of putting in fixes like that too, where I'm like, we don't know why we don't know where, but it's somewhere and we don't have the time to look at it right now. And then, it, right. you know, and then you curse yourself six months later when you break it again and go, what idiot. Oh yeah, that was me. Okay. So <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, what's something we didn't talk about that we didn't actually decide upon was our build server. Um, we have a whole whole conversation about that, about choosing it. And the reason that it came to my mind is I, I've seen build servers that determine the version for you, you know, yeah. and uh, build with a particular version number um, rather than a, dyna a dynamic number. Um, what do you think? So I think we have a lot of options for build servers. Um, we can choose one that's, you know, within the trial that we mm -hmm. have with JFrog. Um, there's other popular ones out there. There's GitHub Actions. Yeah. Um, and again, it's always nice to have, you know, GitHub Actions are great. They're, I mean, yeah. I don't want to say simple, but I mean, they're they're not basic. They're pretty straightforward to use and it's there with your code, which is always a plus. Um, right. But at the same time, it's then it's tool sprawl, right? Are we going to run into issues? Like, is it obviously, I mean, it's, we have, there's a pipelines in, in the JFrog trial. I mean, I don't know. We got to, I guess we got to look at it and see like, are there any, you know, huge downsides to using GitHub Actions? Or maybe we start with GitHub Actions and when it comes time to, you know, maybe that's where we do basic builds, right? And then when we get closer to production time, we start looking at something else or, you know, we just got to make that call at some point. Right. So when I was looking at this code earlier, I'm going to mm -hmm. share it with you again. Yeah. I did notice a folder in here that was labeled CI. Huh. Um, right here. There we go. And if we dig in there, there is a pipeline YAML file. And out of, you know, all the tools that I am familiar with, I'll have some kind of file like this. Um, most of the time YAML. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize what this could be for or what it could be from? I, you know, usually whenever I see any CI stuff, I always just assume it's going to be Jenkins because <laughs> Most of the time, it's it ends up being Jenkins, just because it's really the one of the original ones, right? And it yeah. seems like the one that most people know. But you know, I'm not I'm not yeah, entirely sure about that one. Well, I'm curious about this. It has a lot of you know similar terminology and stuff. It's got resources, jobs, uh, steps, tasks. So like, I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'm going to do some research and see if I can figure out which one this is actually using. That might be one to make sense. Yeah, that would yeah, make exactly. sense to start with. Yeah, at least to get the builds going. And then once we have a better idea of our expectations and how we want this stuff to roll into production, then we can start having a more, you know, scrutinizing look and going, okay, well, we need, we know we need X, Y, and Z that we maybe don't know quite yet. And then we right. can kind of take it from there. Yeah. I think simplest thing to start with, I just want something that when I commit a change or a PR is merged or something like that, that it'll begin a build for me. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, again, it's a easy way where it is like, yeah, if we're just doing these basic builds at this point and we just start with GitHub actions and, you know, go from there or yeah, we'll have to do some looking and see what's going to work best. Cool. Awesome. Well, we have a lot of work to do. Um, yes. We've got some more setup to do uh, to be able to show next time in order to talk about, you know, what's next in our trajectory here. Um, 
what would you like to leave off with? Uh, we still have a bunch of planning we need to do. I know we have a few minutes left together. So um, maybe now's the time to do that. Open up our projects and start filling that in. Yeah. I mean, I know I need to get my my repo moved into the new org, which is always fun. Um, even though GitHub does a great job moving stuff around, uh, I have too many references and random blog posts and articles and old talks. So I need to do some testing to make sure that when we actually do move it between an organization, uh, we don't break it. And I don't have my marketing team coming and yelling at me. So I know that's one of my big ones is, is get that in there and, uh, you know, find its new home. And while we're doing this, we'll be expanding that other project too, I hope. Cool. Well, I'm going to bring it up here. Let's um, do this together, see how far we can get with our remaining time. And um, we'll have a bunch of stuff to look forward to the next time we meet up. Yeah, we got all sorts of stuff to do here, but I'm just, you know, we got that biggest, that biggest start of just, we've got, We've got an organization, so that's always a plus. Right. Good deal. Okay, um, let's go ahead and start adding some projects. This is a good test on whether we can do this together <laughs> in this new tool that we want to use. Hey, look at that. I was going to say, oh, hey, look, they've refreshed pretty quick. That's the problem. Nice. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> that, that actually is kind of nice when I didn't realize and when you click the plus item, it just gives you a little bar across the bottom. So that's really nice for just quickly, you know, I mean, I just typed into there real quick and then you, I mean, there's nothing said in it yet, but yeah, if you just click that, it just really simple, quick way, just put in a title and go for it. Awesome. I like it. All right. There we go. Set up CI. <laughs> yeah. We got to set up those builds. All right. What else do we got to do? We got to, well, we, I mean, we got to, got to make sure we, uh, we're going to have to start getting a, a dev environment here at some point. So we'll have to make sure that um, I've got everything set up in our repo so that when it does come time to actually test it in production or test it in Kubernetes, we can use our other project to build the infrastructure for, for us to deploy on top of. Right. Oh, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Uh, for now, I've just been using like the Kubernetes that comes along with uh, Docker desktop, there are lots of other options, but I mean, at some point we want to make sure that our deploy is consistent across all environments. Um, yeah. So that and we that's, don't get that's always on. the important thing. All right. Well, I know we've got lots of things to fill in here. I don't know, don't know if everybody wants to watch us type away. So maybe we'll, we'll keep filling this out and, and everybody can come and check out how much more we have as we'll, we'll have to have a link to the repo in here somewhere too. So everybody can yeah. come in and follow along with us. Yep. Sounds great. Awesome. Oh, Hey, it's always been fun as always, Melissa. So yeah, looking forward to the next time we get together, get together and do another one. Cool. Talk to you later. All right. Thanks.